Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome to the Complete Machine Learning course. Welcome to course one of Complete Machine Learning. In this lecture, we're going to do an overview of everything you'll learn in this course. Let's start off with our first topic. We're going to learn how to run Python and machine learning models on the web. Following that, we're going to jump into a section about artificial intelligence uninformed search algorithms. We're going to learn how artificial intelligence agents perform search. We'll cover topics like depth first search, breadth first search, depth limited search, uniform cost search, and much more. After that, we're going to look at artificial intelligence informed search algorithms. We're going to cover algorithms like greedy best first search and a star search commonly used by games. Following that, we're going to jump into a section called how machine learning works. We're going to learn how a machine learning agent learns. We'll learn about two types of learning, inductive and statistical. We're going to learn how to make decisions with a decision tree strategy and other topics like calculating performance of an algorithm, specifically in terms of machine learning, and how to handle noisy data. Following that, we're going to jump into our first project together. We're going to build a logistic regression algorithm from scratch. We're going to learn how to prepare data, how to build the model, and we'll also cover how to optimize the model, train, and test it. After that, we're going to build another project where we perform gradient boosted classification. We're going to learn what is gradient boosting, how to build a boosted trees classifier, how to shape data for training and testing, and how to train and evaluate the machine learning model. Then we'll jump into our final project, gradient boosted regression. We're going to build another machine learning model using gradient boosted regression. You'll learn all the terms you need to know, as well as enough theory about the functions and the algorithm types that you need to know before we can jump into coding the projects. This is a projects heavy course. We want to focus on hands on projects for the majority of the course. But there are some key terms and functions you need to know, and we'll guide you throughout everything even if you're a complete beginner. Coming up, we are going to start our first lecture where I'm going to show you how you can build machine learning models on the web. You won't need any software or experience for this course, except for coding in Python, which we will include as well. That's right, you can build machine learning models right on the web without needing to download or install any software. Let's jump into the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to Mammoth Interactive's Complete Machine Learning Course 2.0. In this lecture, I am going to show you how you can build machine learning models and run them, train them, test them, visualize them all on the web. That's right, you don't have to download or install any software for this course. Now you can if you'd like to. If you prefer to run your Python scripts via PyCharm, Visual Studio, Atom, you can run them using an integrated development environment, a program like that. For that, you'd have to download and install that software. But there is a way to build models that are functional, working, and ready to use right on the web without any installation or downloading. For that, just visit the website colab.research.google.com. This is going to take you to a website known as Google Colab, short for Google Collaboratory. You can 
log in with your Gmail account and you'll be taken to Google Colab. It's kind of like Google Docs for coding. Any code that you write in Google Colab, you can execute right here in Google Colab. The default is Python, but you can extend it to other languages. For example, if I type print hello, this is a Python print statement printing out the string hello. All I have to do is run the code cell by clicking this run button and it's going to execute any code in the cell. The first time it runs, it has to connect, so it's going to take a bit of time, a few seconds, but for any subsequent cells, it'll run faster. And look at that, I got the string hello being printed. This means that my Python code was executed as a Python script. Typically, you would do this in a piece of software like PyCharm, but Google Colab makes it very easy to run Python scripts. Here in Google Colab, you can also just add text if you want to add hints, and you can format the text as well. If you'd like to, you can go to File, and you can upload a notebook. With this course, we're going to provide all the source code for each lecture. You can find it at the end of every section. You can upload your own notebooks. They just have to be a .ipynb, which means a Jupyter notebook type. And if you upload a notebook here, you can run its code cells. You can save a copy of the notebook to your Google Drive or download the Jupyter notebook file or the Python file if you want to save it as a Python script. A Jupyter notebook file is a Python file that you can run on Google Colab or on Jupyter notebook. Some more things you can do with Google Colab here is you can edit cells with this edit tab, you can view a table of contents and more, you can insert code cells, text cells, section header cells and more. You can run all the code cells at once with this run all button. That is a useful button because if you close the notebook and you reopen it again, you'll have to run all the code cells again. Because with Google Colab, if I make a cell like I declare a variable called dog and I set it to equal scruffy, if I don't run this code cell and then I start a new code cell and I try to print dog, I'm going to get an error saying that the dog variable was never declared. So you want to make sure you run every code cell if it's important to the current one. There we go. More you can do is you can interrupt execution, you can restart the runtime, you can add an accelerator, a GPU to make your code run faster. You can also manage all of your sessions to delete them if you want to stop a session from being run. And you can access some settings if you want to set preferences. Google Colab is quite a useful tool. You can share your Colab files with anyone you're working with. So this is what we are going to use to build our machine learning models together. We're using Google Colab so that way you don't have to have any system requirements. This course will be compatible on Mac, Windows, Linux. Let's go ahead and jump into our first project. Now that we know how we're going to build out our Python files and our algorithms, let's jump into our first project. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Complete Machine Learning Course 2.0. In this lecture, we are going to learn what are search algorithms. We're beginning our look at the most common search algorithms that you need to know. These are artificial intelligence search algorithms, meaning they are commonly implemented by AI. We're going to be not just looking at what are they, but we are actually going to get our hands dirty and code a lot of them out via Python. Let's get started with what are search algorithms. As an overview, search algorithms consider possible action sequences. When an artificial intelligence agent is trying to figure out what series of actions to take, it has to use an algorithm, a pattern, a strategy 
for how it's going to decide what actions to take next. Search algorithms are used for everything like trying to find the best path along a route throughout cities. You may have heard of the very popular traveling salesman problem. As well, search algorithms are used in robotics for helping robots to make their next move. Search algorithms can be used in games where you have, for example, artificial enemies and bots and they have to decide what action sequences they're going to take to try to kill you, for example. So there are many, many applications of search algorithms. That's why they're very important to learn and we're going to cover the main ones you need to know. They're also commonly asked at the coding interview because, for example, you may be asked to implement searching through a tree or a graph with depth first search or breadth first search that's commonly asked at the software developer interview. All right, so we've so far learned that search algorithms consider possible action sequences. And we've also talked about different real world applications of search algorithms. A solution for such a strategy, such an algorithm, is an action sequence because an algorithm will have a task, for example, find the best route for travel of a salesman through a bunch of cities. And the algorithm's job is to find an action sequence, and that action sequence is the solution. Let's talk about the two types of search strategies. There is uninformed search and informed search. These are the two main categories. We're going to break down exactly what each of them are and some examples of each type like the A star search strategy and depth first search search strategy. Those are just a couple examples of what we're going to look at and what we're going to code out. These are the two types. Now we're going to begin with the uninformed search strategy. That is coming up next. We're going to take a look at uninformed search. There are several types of uninformed search that we're going to look at. Another way of thinking of uninformed search is that it's like blind search because the algorithm has no extra information about states beyond the problem definition. This, as you can imagine, is usually less efficient than informed search because the algorithm has no extra information to make its decision making. And you'll see exactly what that means when we get real examples. Sometimes uninformed search is the only solution though. Sometimes you have no extra information. Sometimes you may be required to implement an uninformed search algorithm as well, such as at the coding interview or to solve some problem. In this type of algorithm, it does not know if one non-goal state is better than another. Let me put it in simple terms. If I'm standing in front of two doorways to try to navigate through a maze as a robot, I won't know if one door is more efficient than another door to get to my end state of perhaps exiting the maze. So I won't have extra information. That makes it inefficient, but we still need to know how it works because sometimes an inefficient solution is the only solution. Sometimes brute force is the only solution. And commonly, brute force is the starting solution. And then you would increment upon it to improve. Coming up, we're going to talk about types of uninformed search. We have depth first search, iterative deepening depth first search, breadth first search, depth limited search, uniform cost search, and bi-directional search. These are very common types that you should know. That's why we're going to break them down and we're going to code some out as well to see how we can search through, for example, a tree or a graph with these types of specific searches. You've probably heard of DFS and BFS that are commonly asked at the coding interview. 
that does it for this lecture so far on what are search algorithms. You learned that search algorithms are commonly implemented in real-world scenarios when artificial intelligence agents, like a robot or a bot or a model, has to make a decision of how to perform some action sequence, such as how to traverse through a maze. The algorithm has to have a strategy of how it's going to choose the best path for getting out of the maze. You also learned that there are two types of search algorithm categories. There's uninformed search and informed search. We did a brief overview of uninformed search where the algorithm has no extra information to make its decision. We saw several types of uninformed search algorithms. And now that we have seen an overview of the types we're going to look at, let's begin with our first type of uninformed search algorithm. We're going to break it down and see exactly how it works in the next lecture. And then we're going to also code it out in Python. I'll see you in that next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to the complete machine learning course 2.0. In this lecture we're going to discuss what is depth first search, commonly called DFS. This is one type of uninformed search algorithm. As you can see here, we'll do an overview of all the types of uninformed search algorithms. And we're beginning with DFS, commonly asked about at the coding interview, and also one type of strategy that artificial intelligence agents use to make decisions about action sequences. Let's get started with depth first search. This type of search strategy expands the deepest unexpanded node. We're going to tunnel down to find the deepest unexpanded node, and that is how we're doing our strategy. Let's take a look at this type of DFS coming up shortly. We're going to see a visualization of this on a tree, but DFS is also commonly used with graphs. This type of search strategy uses the last in first out queue. That means the last node that is put into the queue is the first one that's going to come out of the queue. This is some background that you'll see when we code out the DFS algorithm. You'll see that we'll build out this type of queue implementation in code. But first, let's look at a visualization of depth first search. Here we begin with a tree. This is a binary tree where we have a root node at the top, we have a left child and a right child, and then we have grandchildren as well. We have a left child of B, a right child of B, a left child of C, and a right child of C. This is our tree, and depth first search is going to look for some goal state or it could potentially just be a task of traversing the entire tree. And it's going to do this by going depth first, going as deep as possible with every step it can. And I'll show you a visualization of this. If you've never seen a tree before, a tree is a way of storing data that is connected somehow. Trees are commonly used, for example, for making recommendations for you or also with search engines because they link data together, not like a linked list, but in a tree structure. For example, instead of having to search through an array for a number, instead of having to just search through an array, which can take a long time because an array is a list, by putting data like a numbers, for example, or data about people, it could be anything. By putting data into a tree structure, we can find what we are looking for faster because instead of searching through an entire list of numbers, we can know, for example, the bigger numbers are going to be on the right hand side of this tree. So we can know that if we're looking for a number bigger than 50, we go to the right side instead of the left side. So just that simple step has already cut our 
search time in half because instead of having to look through a whole list we now only have to look through one half of a tree. So that is why trees are useful. They really allow you to speed up your searching. That's just one example of why they're very useful. And they're incredibly commonly used. Trees very often asked about at the coding interview because many companies implement trees in their structure because trees are used for recommendations. For example, if a tree always had all of the numbers bigger than the root on the right and all the numbers less than the root on the left, then you know that if I'm looking for a certain number, I know I should go either left or right. That's just one example of an efficient tree. Trees can get even more efficient than that. Okay, now that you know what a tree is and why it's useful, let's go into depth first search of a tree. Also commonly done on graphs as well, which are like a tree as well. Graphs are very similar to a tree, but let's focus on tree for now. We'll begin depth first search at the root, and then we're going to go as far down as possible. That's why it's called depth first. We'll start left to right. So we'll go from A to its left child, just like how you read, at least in English. And then you'll go down as far as possible. You can see we go from B to D. We don't go from A to B to C. We don't go from A to B to F. We do a very specific strategy, and that's why DFS is a searching strategy for artificial intelligence agents because it's a pattern it's going to follow. It's always going to go as down far as possible. Now, what does it do when it can't go down anymore? Well, it's going to go back up and try again with the next possible neighbor. And note that we're always going from left to right. So we go from A to its left child, and then from B, B has two children, D and E, but we always are going to go to the left one, if possible. And that's just a common rule. After we have gone from A to B to D, we then visit E, because it's the next deepest. Like we mentioned at the beginning, depth first search will always expand the deepest unexpanded node. And we're talking about depth in terms of levels here. This tree, it has two levels. A is level zero, and then B and C are level one, and D, E, F, G are level two, because level counting starts at zero. And so we're always looking for the node that we can expand, which means the node that we can go to, that is as deep as possible in the levels. That is the strategy of depth first search. All right, so after we go to E, what do you think is going to happen? Well, we're going to go back up the tree and try again with as deep as possible. So we're going to go to C. And after C, what do you think we're going to visit? If you said F, you're correct. We then visit F because we're always going to go to the next deepest possible child and it will be the left one first. And finally we visit G. As such we have covered all of the nodes on the tree which was the goal and we've done it with depth first search. We are going to code out depth first search as well shortly following this lecture so you're going to see this type of strategy applied in code. And that is depth first search. In this lecture you learned what is depth first search. You learned that it is one type of uninformed search. You also learned that depth first search and all uninformed search types are commonly used with trees and graphs. For that you learned what is a tree and then we saw a visualization of how an AI agent would use this type of strategy, DFS, to traverse through an entire tree. Now that we have understood what is DFS, we have an idea of the strategy that an agent would take, let's code it out so that way we can see the implementation in code. 
we're going to build a function that's going to do what we just saw. It's going to take a tree structure and it's going to traverse the entire tree using depth first search. I'll see you in that next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to the complete machine learning course. In this lecture we are going to build a depth first search algorithm in Python. That way you can see how it can actually be implemented. This is also commonly a coding interview question asked at the software developer interview. So it's important to learn about depth first search. First off we are going to define a class called node which represents every node on a tree. For this example we're going to use a tree and traverse through the tree using depth first search. You could also apply depth first search to a graph. Let's define the constructor putting in the self and the key for each node. We'll define the left child as being none by default and we'll define the right child as also being none by default for the, each node on the tree. And we'll assign self.value to equal the key that's passed in. That represents the value at every node. Next up, let's go ahead and define a tree. We are going to make a root variable and we'll put in some value like node A. Following that, let's go ahead and define the children and grandchildren. For that, we'll set the left child of the root to be a node B. Then we'll set the root's right child to equal a node C. We are recreating the visualization from the previous lecture now via code. Let's make the grandchildren next. We'll take the root's left child and let's make its left child. That will be a node containing the character D. In this case it's a string. And we're going to then assign the right child of the left child to be a node containing the letter E. And let's do the other child, right child, and set its left child to equal a node containing F. Here we are building out our tree structure and we're almost done. We'll set the right child's right child, so the rightmost grandchild, to equal a node containing the letter G. As such, we have built out a tree structure, but how do we now traverse it using depth first search? Well, there are three types of depth first search. There is pre order, in order, and post order search. And they are all a type of depth first search. And they're all very similar, so we really only have to cover one for an example. Let's run this code cell to create a node class and as well to define a tree. And let's add a new code cell where we are going to build out a function that's going to perform depth first search. So let's call this depth first search and we'll put in the root which is the starting point of the search. First we have to perform a check that is going to be if the root exists, if the root is not none. Because if we ever reach a value of none, we want to stop going down that depth of the tree because a none value is like a dead end. Depth first search means that first we're going to print one of the values. Either the roots value, if we are doing pre-order traversal, if we're doing in order traversal, we would visit the left child first and then we would go to the root. And if we were doing post order traversal, we would visit the left child, then the right child, and then the root. That's just an extra detail. Pre order traversal, it's going to visit the root and then it's going to visit the left child and then it's going to visit the right child. That is pre-order traversal. And there are 
several other types of traversal as well. There is post-order traversal, and these are all types of depth-first search. With post-order traversal, first you visit the left child, then you visit the right child, and then you visit the root last, which is why it's called post, because post means after, whereas pre means before. The third type of common depth-first search you need to know about is called in-order traversal where first you'll visit the left child and then you'll visit the root and then you'll visit the right child. It's called in order because you're going left to right from the left child to the root to the right child. These three are all types of depth first search on a tree. And really the only difference is the order in which you call each of the values. In this case we're going to do pre-order traversal, which means we'll print the root value first. After that, we use recursion, so we call the same function inside of itself, but this time we're going to recur on the left child. This means that we are going to print out the root and then the left child of the left child itself. In that way, it's kind of like those self-containing dolls where you have one inside of the other inside of the other. Recursion is the same type of idea where we're going to the left child of the root of the tree and then we're going to the root of that left child and the left child of that child and then we go down and down and down. Now because we're doing pre-order traversal you can see here we're visiting the root first and then we're visiting the left child. So what do we have to do next? Well we have to visit the right child. So we'll call depth first search on root dot right child. If we wanted to do another type of traversal, like post order or in order, we would just change the location of our lines here. Instead of calling the root first, we would call root.leftchild to be printed first. All right. And now we can run this function because this is all we need to build a depth first search algorithm. Yes, it's just quite this easy. We just have really five lines of code for the actual search algorithm. Let's add another code cell and we'll call depth first search on the root that we built. Remember the root is this tree that we defined earlier. Let's go ahead and run the code cell and look at that. We now have A, B, D, E, C, F, G. You should recall from the previous lecture that this is the exact order in which we traversed the tree using depth first search. Because first we go to the root A, then we go to the left child B, then we go to the left child of that which is D, and the right child of B which is E, and then we go back up to C, and then its children F and G. This proves that we successfully managed to build a depth first search algorithm. All right, now you have not just the theory of this algorithm, but also some hands-on application of how you can code it into your programs. Join me in the next lecture where we're going to look at another type of search algorithm commonly used by AI agents. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy it before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.